Hello everyone, my name is Leah Neitz and this is part four of the Mercy Gap series, Beyond the Veil. So let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time with you. Thank you for sending the helper, the Holy Spirit, to teach us all things and bring to mind everything that you have spoken. Thank you for enlightening our understanding, giving us wisdom and revelation into your word and your mysteries and your truth. Please bless everyone who hears this or watches it and let nothing come out of my mouth that is not of you and just guide this whole video, this whole process. Help me to stay right in the lane you want me in and speak everything you want me to speak in the order that you want me to speak it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this is actually take two. I made another one last week, but it was such a mess. I'm putting it in the hot mess playlist. So I am posting it, but it's hard to follow. It was hard for me to follow and it was my own brain. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I understood myself, but I'm like, nobody else is going to understand this. So to start off with this one, so we're in Mercy Gap part four. It would be good if you haven't already to listen to or watch the first three and also the 5784 word because that comes into play and maybe read Isaiah 2 and Daniel 7 and Revelation 6, the part with the sixth seal. Kind of pause this and do that so you kind of have an idea of all of the different connections because there's a lot of connections between those particular chapters and a lot more of the Old Testament with Revelation and Revelation 6 in particular. So first we're going to start off with Isaiah 25, 7 in the New King James. And we've gone over this one a couple times before. It says, and he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. And the word veil is spelled with an A in the King James Version on purpose. And I went over this a little bit, I think, because actually maybe I didn't. Maybe that was in that hot mess of part four. <laughs> That veil is spelled that way because to veil with an A-I-L means to cast your crown, to tip your hat as a sign of paying homage, of worship, of bowing down to something. So to veil would be like to take off your hat and bow down. And the translator of the King James Version, I believe, knew that he needed a word that described a covering, something that would cover your face and blind you, but also something that pointed to idolatry, to idol worship. So he chose that word on purpose. The rest of the versions, I think all of them say veil with an E-I-L, but it's not like a bridal veil. And I go over that pretty extensively in a previous video. And I will see, I will try to remember this and link it to here. But I, I encourage you to look into the Strong's Concordance on this. You can go to biblehub.com and look up Isaiah 25. And then you can, if you go in there in the Strong's, you can even just do a search for Isaiah 25 Strong's and you'll see Bible Hub come up. Or you can download the app. Go to the King James Version Strong's Concordance and any word that you tap on, it will show you the Hebrew that is, or the Greek, depending on if you're in the Old or the New Testament. And you can see what those words mean, all the verses that use that word, how they're translated in other verses. It goes deeper into the exhaustive Strong's Concordance. They have the Brown Drivers Briggs in there. So there's all these resources. So you can see what the Hebrew is really saying because our language, the English language, really doesn't portray well enough what is said in the Hebrew language in the Bible. Okay, so I encourage you to do that. So that word veil is, is, it's idol worship. That's what it is. And God is removing all of that covering. And we talked about that a little bit. We talked about what the mercy gap is. It's a time where spiritual blindness is completely removed and people have the opportunity to see God for who he is and to know the devil and all of his minions for who they are. They can see the darkness. They cast away their idols. We talked about how the wicked will flee and they'll go into the rocks the crags and hide from the great day of the Lord. They will be terrified. And we talked about how the people won't be terrified who are part of the Joel II army, who are part of the body of believers that exist in this time. 
and they are the assembly of the saints. It will be a little bit frightening for believers who aren't awake yet, who aren't part of that remnant army, who've not been fully awoken and haven't been paying attention. It will be a shock to their system, but in the end they will rejoice because they will be like, yes, this is Jesus, this is God, this is good, this is what's going on. Also, something that I didn't mention when talking about the great day of the Lord, the assembly of the saints, it's actually mentioned all the way back in Genesis when God says, I believe it's to Abraham, that I will make you a nation and a company of nations. I will make you, your offspring will be a nation and a company of nations. So we have the nation of Israel and the company of nations, the assembly of the saints, every tribe, tongue, and nation that chooses the Lord, every person that, that that's in that group of people. And that word company is a military term, and it means a group of people coming together for a cause to fight for it. Like it's something that they're, they're willing to fight for and they're unified together. Also today, so I'm planning on doing three videos today. Maybe I'll just do two, maybe I'll just do one. Maybe I'll do one a day so I don't get my head all in a jumble again. But the Lord, pointed me as I was going over the notes for the third video that I was planning for today. He pointed me to Malachi and as I'm reading, I'm like, oh my goodness, there's confirmation of these groups of people in Malachi. So we're gonna go there real quick. So we're going to read Malachi 3, 16 through 4, 3. And just as a thing that I do, I always give commentary within the reading that I'm doing. I just can't help it. It's just what I do. So. You can follow along in your Bible or you can look it up later, but I will have commentary in here. Just know that. So if you're like, the Bible doesn't say that, it's because it's my own commentary. Okay. So we're in the New King James Version. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another and the Lord listened and heard them. And Malachi had just addressed the people of Israel, accused them of robbing God and scolded them for things that they had been doing. But those who feared the Lord spoke to one another and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him in heaven. For those who fear the Lord, all those who fear the Lord, not just these people, and who meditate on his name, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. And that's what we're looking at when that spiritual blindness is removed. It will be very easy to discern between them. Okay. Chapter four, for behold, the day is coming, this great, terrible day of the Lord burning like an oven and all the proud. Yes. All who do wickedly will be stubble and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root or, nor branch, but you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings and you shall go out and grow fat like stall fed calves. You shall trample the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so you have a distinction here. You have a day coming, a great terrible day of the Lord and the wicked are terrified and go and hide from the wrath because wrath is coming upon them and the righteous are blessed. They are not terrified, they are rejoicing. And it's not only those who already know the Lord that rejoice, even the people who haven't received Christ yet will rejoice because all of a sudden there won't be any distractions from Satan that are keeping them from seeing who God is. And they'll be like, oh, look at you, I choose you. And then they will be believers and they will be rejoicing. So the terror really only comes on the wicked, wicked, and it's temporary angst and discomfort on those who aren't paying attention and those who aren't believers yet. But in God's mind, everyone who makes a decision for the Lord is already known. He already sees them because he sits outside of time. Okay, so now I'm going to clarify a little bit of Joel 2, 6, because I briefly touched on this. And I talked about, it says something like, the faces gather paleness and this is actually good and bad, but I didn't really explain that. And I haven't, I don't think I've explained it in any of my other videos. So I wanted to go through a breakdown of that real quick. So Joel 2, still in the New King James, 
verse six. So this is after the people come great and strong and are kind of going over the mountains and all that, this terrible army that's coming. It's the army of the Lord, the assembly of the saints. And this is a spiritual battle and it is the spiritual battle of Jericho. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. But in the King James Version, it says, Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. And when I saw that, I was like, what does that mean? Because when I had really studied it before, I was mostly in the New King James. So I didn't see this gather blackness. But a friend of mine, Dr. Nigel Big Pond, had sent me a message. The Lord had him text me, Joel 2, 1 through 7. And I was like, what did I miss? Because I have a book coming out and a large part of that has to do with this Joel 2 army. So I had studied Joel 2, like I had studied it. And I'm like, what am I missing? So I decided to just look at those verses in the Strong's Concordance. And because I did that, I automatically went to the King James and then I saw this language and I was like, what does it mean to gather blackness? So first it says before their face, the people shall be much pained. Their face is their countenance, their appearance, their presence. And the people were terrified of Moses's face after he was in the presence of the Lord because he glowed. And I'm not saying everybody's going to glow physically, although we could, but his face was radiant and it freaked the people out. So he veiled his face. And there's actually a verse in the New Testament. I believe it's in Romans. I cover it in my book a bit where it actually talks about how that was because of the old law, the old way of doing things. But now we have unveiled faces. We will not be covering up the glory of God, especially when it manifests and people can see it, whether they're seeing it in the spirit or in the natural. So their face is their countenance, their presence. And this word also is the same word for surface. And it's used in Genesis 1, where it says that the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. It's the surface. It's the thing that you see. And it also speaks to the fact that that was covered up by the surface of the covering cast over the face of the people. Okay, so before their face, the people shall be much pained. This word for pained, I can't even pronounce it. It's like C-H-U-W-L and I don't even want to try. So, but you can look it up. It means writhe, bear, or dance. So you have writhing in pain, in anguish. You have bearing, like giving birth to a child. And you have dancing, rejoicing. And I'm like, okay, well, this is odd. So, but this is, this is pointing to the wicked who are writhing, freaking out in terror. The people that are giving birth to who they really are, finding out who God is and who they're, who they are meant to be you know, their true identity in Christ, finding Christ and finding their identity in Christ, giving birth to that and dancing and rejoicing the people that already know the Lord and have been waiting for this time. Okay. So there's three things that will happen when this Joel 2 army is unleashed and it's getting ready to be. So then all faces gather blackness and all means the whole. It means every single person in all of those groups from the people in the Joel 2 army to the wicked that are hiding in the crags and the rocks. Okay. So everyone, the whole, what do they do? They take up, they gather, collect blackness, except this word blackness isn't the way that we view blackness. It's not like a color, like my shirt. It's not like all of our faces go like this, okay? It's not that kind of blackness. It also isn't necessarily being freaked out in terror. This word blackness is parur. It's used twice in the Bible. It's used once here and once, I believe, in Nehemiah. And it's from the word par, P-A, little hyphen, A-R. And it means 
beauty. It's being illuminated. It's getting a glow or a flush of anxiety. So it can be panic, but it can also be light, like Moses's face was radiant. Illumination, the light of God shining through us, okay? The Brown Driver's Briggs, which is another like deep dive resource, when you go to that Strong's Concordance, that shows up along with it. It says, all faces gather a glow with dread or gather in their beauty. So what this is saying is, when this Joel II army comes through and initiates the rolling back of the sky as a scroll, the removal of spiritual blindness, the sons and daughters of God are revealed, along with the sons of disobedience and perdition. Everyone is revealed for who they are. And those who are wicked are covered in terror and pain. Those who don't know who they are, give birth to who they are. And those who know the Lord, who are made righteous, when I say the righteous, I'm not talking about self-righteousness. I'm not talking about being good enough. Those who have placed their trust in Jesus and are covered by the blood of Jesus and have had their sins completely removed from them, who are righteous in the sight of God because of that, they are revealed as the sons and daughters of God. And you can see that radiance in them. I don't know if we can see it with our natural eyes, but we will see it in some way, shape, or form. I hope it's with our natural eyes. I still want to glow. Wouldn't that be fun? Kind of like that, the star in uh, the voyage of the, the Dawn Treader, that Chronicles of Narnia movie, there's a star that comes and she's like all glowy. And I'm like, oh, that's what it will be like. Won't that be cool? I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. So this removal of spiritual blindness and this exposing of who we are also exposes who God really is and how worthless the images of demons, the idols are. How absolutely worthless and no help at all to us, they are. And the people actually cast off these idols on their own. They voluntarily give up idolatry not just those who choose God, but the wicked as well. They realize these can't help me and they toss them and flee. <laughs> like that's what happens. And at this point, it would be good if you haven't to look at that 5784 word because that really shows you how permanent this removal of idolatry is from these people. Like it's just, it's absolutely permanent. They don't go back. There's no place that can be found for them. The wicked and the righteous cast off their idols. And why would the, the righteous have idols? It's anything that we place our trust in to take care of us. And all of us stumble on this at some point. Sometimes we fail to remember that Jesus is our source, that God is our source for life and for everything, for taking care of all of our lives and everything in them. And whenever we place something above him that is idolatry so all of those things are stripped and cast away from the wicked and from the righteous who have just been kind of distracted by those things and not realizing what they were doing so it's not like a willing i'm worshiping idols and i'm a believer it's not like you're going and bowing down before buddha and also believing in jesus it's like you've been dependent on your own strength for food for resources for money for health you know whatever it is all of us in some area of our life are dependent on something other than god for something and it's hard for us to let that go but when this happens we will be able to completely let all of those things go and put our full trust in god and really step into the authority that we have as believers so now we're going to look at isaiah 28 20 because this kind of describes the state of people who are caught up in the troubles of this life and have been blinded by the world just with all the other things that have taken their focus off the truth of who God is and who they are in him. For the bed is too short to stretch out on and the covering so narrow that one cannot wrap himself in it. 
this is talking about those stumbling blocks of Satan. The words here, that narrow covering is actually, it's like a boa constrictor. Like when you look into all of the language here in the Hebrew, it describes this hope in something to help you, this striving for sustenance in whatever area that is never enough, always chokes you, you end up confused and out of breath and unable to collect yourself, collect your thoughts, figure out who you are, what your purpose is. That's what these blinders of Satan do. And a lot of people are in this category in and out of the church. A lot of those who haven't found Jesus yet that just haven't been able to see him are stuck in this category. And there are some believers that are still stuck in this, this category. So this is what's going to be taken away. This narrow covering, which is actually a boa constrictor. It's Satan trying to squeeze the life out of you. And this place of rest, this bed that you can't even stretch out on because it's never enough. Because if it's not God, it's never enough. End of story. So what does it look like when the veil is removed and these idols are tossed off and everyone realizes what's going on? What does this actually look like? We're going to read Isaiah 2. And this is the place in the hot mess part for where everything just got all jumbled. But there are references here to Revelation, to the sixth seal, and to Daniel 7. So when I mention those, know that I'm not leaving Isaiah 2. I'm just plugging in that there is language here that is the same language or very, very close to that language that's in Daniel 7 and Revelation or whatever other place. But we're staying in Isaiah 2 here. Okay, the word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And I'm going to pause right here when it says Judah and Jerusalem or Judah and the house of David. Judah also includes all Gentile believers that are grafted into God's family. It includes every believer whenever it speaks of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, who is our savior and died on the cross for our sins and was raised on the third day. So whenever you see this, it's encompassing all believers when it says Judah, okay? The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above all hills, above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. And this is the mountain of the Lord, that's mentioned in Daniel 2. Again, we're staying in Isaiah 2. But when the stone is cut out, but not by human hands, and it's hurled at the foot of the giant idol, that 5784 word is important right there. And it grows into a huge mountain, the mountain of the Lord. That's what this is talking about right here in Isaiah 2. So all people flow to it, all nations flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. When the saints possess the kingdom, when that verdict which is being issued even now. Daniel saw it already issued because everything is finished in heaven. But that verdict on behalf of the saints, and they slay that terrible beast with the little horn, which is not the same as the Antichrist beast in Revelation. I want to clarify that as well. That little horn, that beast is slain. The other beasts still are there, but their power is taken away. They're kind of sitting in the corner being quiet because they've been beat down so badly. When that time comes and people get a taste of heaven on earth, that peace, that's what it looks like. People no longer learn the art of war. That word learn is a constant striving to get better at, develop new ways of doing war. And there is no more war there. 
There's no more war. Back to Isaiah 2. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with eastern ways. They are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they are pleased with the children of foreigners. And right now in our world, God is breaking off that bond. They are unequally yoked, and much of Israel is not saved. Much of them are not even orthodox. They follow their calendar and have their feast days, but they are very, very much secular and pagan and have kind of melded together with the people around them, which is not what they were ever supposed to do. Not because Gentiles are icky, but because the people around them are worshiping false gods and are full of wickedness and violence. And they were never supposed to conform to those ways. If those people come over to the Lord, great. But if they don't, they're not supposed to be intermingling with that. They are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they are pleased with the children of foreigners. That also speaks to child trafficking. Their land is also full of silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. People bow down, and when it says that which their own fingers have made, it doesn't necessarily mean like a graven image. If you are worshiping your job, if you are worshiping something that you built, this beautiful house you built, if you're worshiping stuff that you worked for, you're worshiping the work of your hands, okay? People bow down and each man humbles himself. Therefore, do not forgive them. And this word forgive means spare. Do not spare them. And the people of God are not supposed to be sparing them, accepting the wickedness. They're supposed to be speaking against the wickedness, driving out the darkness. That doesn't mean that we hurt other people. We battle in the spirit, but we don't accept evil and wicked lifestyles as good. And we don't candy coat the truth and we don't make it all cushy and comfortable for people to walk right straight into hell. We don't do that. So then we have verse 10 in Isaiah 2, which points to Revelation 6. And that sixth seal, enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. And that's what the wicked do when that sky is rolled back as a scroll. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up and it shall be brought low upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, and upon every fortified wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon the beautiful sloops. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day but the idols he shall utterly abolish. They shall go into the holes of the rocks. Again, Revelation 6 mentioned here. And into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. And in Joel 2, the earth shakes before them and... The heavenly bodies are shaken. The sun and the moon don't show their light. The same thing happens before the Joel 2 army because the spirit of God lives in us and he does everything through his body. And remember in Joel 2, it also says he gives voice before his army for his camp is very great. He sends that sound in that shakes the earth mightily before us, before him. So then still in Isaiah 2, verse 20, in that day, this is what happens when the spiritual blindness is removed. A man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each for himself to worship, the, to the moles and bats. And this is the only time I think the word moles is used in the Bible, which is interesting. To go into the clefts of the rocks and into the crags of the rugged rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. 
Sever yourselves from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils, for of what account is he? And this word sever doesn't mean that we don't associate with people who don't know the Lord yet. This word sever, I don't know why they use this language in the New King James, because it's don't put your trust in man is what it's saying. Don't put your trust in these people who seem to have all of this power, but are now going to run and hide in the caves and call onto the rocks to fall on them. Don't trust them. Sever yourselves from having faith in anyone other than God. That's what this is speaking. So then we're going to look at Isaiah 3.10, because this, again, is the difference between the people of God and the people who are not of God, who have rejected God. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them. It is going to be well with the righteous. It is well with our souls. For they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. As for my people, well, we've already gone over that. So we're going to stop right there. Verse 11. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. So there is a distinction drawn between God's people, and that includes God's people who don't know him yet in time, because everyone who's going to choose him is already known by God, and he includes them as his people. So when all of this happens, the veil, that spiritual blindness, isn't only removed from Gentiles, it's also the scales being taken off the eyes of Israel as well. When that that mercy gap happens in between the sixth and seventh seal. It starts with 144,000 of Israel being marked as followers of God. That's what it starts with. And some people believe that each of those people represents a larger group of people. Some people believe that the Ezekiel war happens and there are so few Jewish people left that that's the bulk of their nation that's left. There's a lot of different theories there. I'm not going to theorize on it. But those people of Israel are marked because they suddenly see him. And a multitude from every tribe, tongue, and nation appears in heaven. And they are holding palm branches in their hands because those are the spoils of war. That's their evidence that they defeated the enemy. Because Jericho is also called the city of palm trees in Deuteronomy. And Jesus trampled on palm fronds and the coverings of the people on his way into Jerusalem during his triumphal entry. That was a prophetic sign of what he was doing, that he was cutting off the dominion of Satan from the world and trampling it underfoot. So those palm fronds are spoils of war. And some versions of the Bible say that these people... They come out of the great tribulation, but some say just great tribulation. And I can't find, I mean, I could probably look harder, but I haven't found the the, like why is the the there? Why is there a the? I don't know why there's a the there. But some people say the great tribulation and some say great tribulation. Either way, this is not talking about the bowls of wrath or the trumpets. And I believe it's also not talking about the time of the Antichrist that follows this. I believe the only believers that are left on the earth during the Antichrist beast in Revelation, that big one, you know, where you take the mark of the beast and all of that, the only believers left are Israeli. They're only Jewish people. And all the Gentile believers are gone. They've been caught up with the Lord. And the reason why I believe that is because of this multitude showing up where it, do, where it does before the seventh seal. There's also some other passages we're going to go over in the next video about that. But also because Jesus said that there would be an end to the time of the Gentiles, that the Gentiles would trample on Jerusalem, like it would not be an Israeli city fully taken over by Israel until the time of the Gentiles is completed. And when that time is completed, it's completed. There is no one in the book of Revelation that turns to the Lord when all of the bowls of wrath and the trumpets are poured out on the people, the inhabitants of the earth. No one turns because they can't, because that decision is final. After this mercy gap is done, 
it's final because the opportunity to choose the Lord here is without any blinders of Satan. So there is no excuse for anybody who chooses not to follow God. So if you don't know him already, you can't work your way into God's favor. By grace, you are saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast and brag about how good they were. There is no self-righteousness there. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins and rose on the third day, conquering death for us. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you haven't made that decision, just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, to die on the cross for my sins. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead so that I could spend eternity with you. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be the king of my life. Indwell me with your spirit. Take my life and do something with it and baptize me in the Holy Spirit and fire in Jesus name. Woohoo! Amen. All right. So, so now you're going. If you spoke those words and you meant them in your heart, you are going to heaven. You are a child of God and you are covered and perfect from conception on into eternity. As far as the East is from the West, so far as he removed your transgressions from you and East and West never touch each other. Also, the East is where the sun rises, but if you stay looking East, it gets dark. That's where the darkness is. And the West, if you always go West, you're always following the light. So follow the light, go West. All right. So we will talk about the nation of Israel, the morning whom they have pierced, and some other things in part five. So I will see you guys later. Have a wonderful day or evening, whenever it is. And remember that you are gold.